Hello and welcome. As we gather another week in this way, we so look forward to what's ahead. And I want to say a special welcome and acknowledgement to our youth and children that are with us this morning and have been with us in this way. And we're so glad that you guys are joining us. And I want to just acknowledge in that that we really look forward to what's ahead and to the summer and ways that we can continue to connect and maybe even gather in some more meaningful ways. Uh, and we're really excited about that. And also a special acknowledgement to you high school seniors and to some of you eighth graders and how this is kind of an anticlimactic end to the school year. But we're really excited to honor you guys and hopefully transition you guys well into the next season. So love you guys a ton and uh, we're really excited for ways that we can, we can do that. Uh, as many of you are aware, we sent out a couple days ago an email that had a video where Mark and Dave shared our plans for reopening and beginning to gather again. And there was also a survey in that email uh, that we are hoping to get from everyone in our community with just some questions to get some feedback. So if you could take two to three minutes to fill that out today, that would be amazing. And you can find that link to that survey online on our Grace Now website or you can go back to the email and find the link in there. Uh, but it'll take two to three minutes, so it'd be awesome if you could do that today. Uh, with that, let's pray as we enter into our time together. God, we acknowledge you. We acknowledge you wherever we are at right now. Would you open our hearts and our minds to whatever it is that you have for us today, and focus our attention on you. We praise you for who you are and all that you have done. Continue to work in us and around us and make us aware of your presence and all that you are doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, the plain truth is for most of us who follow Jesus, and truly look to be committed, our natural inclination is to believe in this and assent to it intellectually and then muscle our way through our problems instead of resting in God's work, instead of trusting in Him. And we say in those moments, like, how do I trust in God? And we don't know. But how we trust in God doesn't start when the fears and the uncertainties arise. It starts in moments just like this, singing truths to Him and to ourselves, Letting the, letting the words wash over us, wash over our hearts, our minds, preparing our minds, souls, bodies, strength to trust, not to fear. So let's take this moment right now with a mind to surrendering to God's work every day, to listening to his spirit every second, to removing ourselves from the places where we adversely affect the equation. So let's sing. Wherever you are right now, we sing in reverence and in humility. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my right. And free. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine.
As we begin closing out our study of the Holy Spirit, we'll be in Galatians 3 today, and we'll see that it is by faith that we experience the work of the Spirit. So here it is, Galatians 3, 1 through 10. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it is really for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that ho those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance of Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are finally nearing the end of our Holy Spirit series, and we will officially conclude next week very fittingly with Pentecost Sunday, which I think will be a great way to finish up this series. And, you know, our goal all year has been to gain a more comprehensive understanding and hopefully also experience of the Spirit's work in our lives, to be reminded that His work is not limited in scope to just a few activities and behaviors in our lives, but actually everything we do in the Christian life is done in the Spirit. The, the truth is we cannot live a single day well without Him. And that's one of the beauties of the gospel is that God has given us His own Spirit to do in us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So in light of all that we've heard, I wanted to leave us today with this question that Paul asks, very poignant question in verse 3. And here's what he says. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? And I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves regularly. After beginning with the Spirit, am I now trying to attain my goal by human effort? So a little context. The Galatians were a group of Gentiles living in what is now modern-day Turkey. And on one of his missionary journeys, Paul had passed through that town and he had preached the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And many of them had received it and they'd experienced God's grace and his forgiveness. They'd experienced the spirit coming on them. They became believers. But then sometime later, some folks came most likely from Jerusalem 
uh, who were Jewish in background, and their message was basically, faith in Jesus is, is great as far as it goes, but you need to add to that faith works of the law if you really want to be acceptable to God. So in that day, works of the law would be things like you got to eat kosher. Um, you have to be circumcised if you're a man. You have to observe the Sabbath every Saturday. And so the Galatians were beginning to be tempted to think that their relationship with God wasn't just dependent on faith in the Spirit, but it was dependent on their own human efforts. That is about what they did that would make them acceptable to God. And so they started moving from a life in the Spirit to works of the law. And so Paul in this passage, uh, he wants to remind them of a few things. And so first, he, he wants to remind them of how their spiritual journey started in the first place. So look at verse 2. He says, I would like to just learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? And then verse 5. So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you've heard? And what he's doing is he's taking them back to the beginning of their journey with God. And he said, you know, before I came to you, you guys were a bunch of, of unspiritual pagans. You, you weren't these, you know, moral law-keeping religious elites. You didn't know a lick about God's law. I came in and you just heard this message, this good news about Jesus, and you believed it. You trusted it. And when you did that, God's spirit filled you and moved in you and you experienced his spirit, but none of that had to do with your keeping of the law. It was your faith in the message of forgiveness and grace that you heard. So your, your journey began with faith and with what the spirit was up to in ways that you could never have done in yourselves. So it reminds them of their own, the beginning of their journey. And then he goes on, this is interesting in verse six, to remind them of Abraham's own journey. And I think that's probably because, you know, these people from Jerusalem kind of considered themselves super Jews. And so Paul's like, well, let's, let's talk about Abraham. I mean, he's the father of the Jews. He's the greatest Jew of all. What was his experience? And in verse 6, he says this, So also Abraham, and he quotes from Genesis 15, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He reminds them, even Abraham, his relationship with God wasn't based off of works of the law. It was based off of faith. I mean, Abraham himself was a pagan at one point. And God entered into his life. And in this beautiful moment in Genesis 15, God takes Abraham out to the night sky. And he shows him all the stars. And he says, you know, I know you and Sarah can't bear children right now. But I'm promising you I'm going to do something for you guys. So that as many stars as you can see, that's as many descendants as you will have. And Abraham heard that message and he believed it. He trusted God. And the scriptures say, and God counted that trust as righteousness. Hey, you trust me? That's what makes you right with me. And I would guess for so many of us, if we looked back to our, the beginning of our journey of faith with God, we'd be reminded that that time, that, that wasn't about like what we could do. For God, that wasn't about our moral performance, our ability to perfectly, you know, achieve things. It was about hearing a message about God's grace and forgiveness and simply trusting and experiencing God's spirit moving in us, doing things that we couldn't predict and we couldn't have done in ourselves. But that time was all about God's work in our lives. It had nothing to do with our work for God. And so all that to say, it all started with the spirit. It all started with faith. And so Paul's reminding them of how it all began. And then he's asking them this great question. After beginning with the Spirit, after beginning with faith, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? And what I want to just remind us today that that, that is one of the great temptations of the Christian life, to begin with faith, to begin with the Spirit, but then over time, as the years roll on, we slowly start to go back to human effort. And we kind of subtly say or think, you know, God, you, you rescued me, you, you changed my life, but, but I'll take it from here. Now it's kind of, it's up to me to live this life well by my own efforts and my own abilities. 
and we can start to think of our relationship with God in these terms where, okay, God's up there somewhere and he's laid down some laws and some principles for me to live by. And now it's a matter of how well I can execute on that, how well I can follow and obey those laws. And God's up there and he's watching me and his approval of me goes up and down depending on how well I am able to pull that off. And if you think about it, that's actually a really self-centered view of life because it's, it's kind of saying it's, it's really up to me. I'm at the center of this and it's, it's not up to God, it's, it's up to me. And that is so not the gospel, but that is so our natural bent, isn't it? I mean, we, we almost can't help but slowly fall back into that way of thinking. Um, right now we have a car and its alignment is slightly off and I couldn't help but think about that in this way. Like if you just let the car drive, it just, it kind of slowly naturally starts going to one side without any correction. And, and our hearts are so bent to move towards, it's up to us to, to do this right. And we can, can forget about the spirit. We can forget about the gospel and faith. And so Paul in this passage is reminding the Galatians, he's, he's reminding us, no, no, it's about the Spirit from start to finish. The Spirit is your helper every single day of your life. And that is the beauty of the gospel. We don't have a God who just says, I'll rescue you, you know, from eternal judgment, but then it's up to you to figure out how to live your life the rest of your life. No, we have this God who says, I want to be with you. I've given you my spirit to be in you. I want to walk with you every single day of your life. And so I don't need you to impress me. I'm not looking for you to impress me by your own efforts. I want you to trust me. Trust me. Surrender to my spirit. Allow me to do in you what you can't do in yourself. That is the good news. But like I said, it's, it's so hard for us to continue to live in that place. To go back to an analogy I used at the very beginning of this series, so the spirit is like the wind. And we talked about this analogy. If the spirit's the wind, then our lives are like, like these boats. And we're being invited to, to draw up the sail, to surrender to the spirit every day so that he blows and moves in our lives, to depend on him, to trust in him, to look to him. But the challenge is sometimes the spirit is unpredictable. And we don't always know what it's going to do. So sometimes it's easier just to get out those oars and you just kind of start rowing. And the truth is you're not going to get very far when you're using those oars, but at least it feels like you're doing something. And that's the constant temptation. And Paul is saying, no, no, continue to raise the sail, continue to trust, continue to look to the spirit, to God, to do in you what you can't do in yourself. So that's where I want to leave us. In this series and and today I, I want to leave you with a bit of my own journey uh, over the past four months of trying to live in the spirit and you know we've had four months <laughs> to talk about the spirit so I've had a lot of time myself just to process what does it mean for me in this season of my, of my life to to walk with the spirit to depend on him to trust in him and so I want to share just a couple ways that I've been processing that over these months and and I want to acknowledge my my journey is, is my journey it's my issues are going to be unique to me, but I, I share them hoping that as you hear the way I'm processing my journey, it might trigger some things in you and help you think through what would it look like for me to be living and to continue to live by the Spirit in this time. So for me, I'm learning that living by the Spirit starts the very first moment of my day. Like those first minutes of my day are, are absolutely essential. And what I'm learning is even after about 25 years of trying to follow Jesus fairly seriously, I would say, um, every morning I wake up and there is still this default alignment, this default posture of my heart towards a certain set of things. And if there were a word that I would use to describe that posture, it's actually a word that shows up in verse 8, and it's the word justify. Uh, verse 8, Paul says, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. But what happens in me, I wake up and there's this, this bent, this voice in me that says, you need to justify your existence today, Dave. Meaning you need to somehow prove your worth. You need to perform in a way that shows that you're legit, that 
that you're competent, that you're good enough, whatever, whether that be to others or to God or even, even to yourself. And so for me, I'm learning that the first task of my day, every single day, is to first just acknowledge those voices and recognize them for what they are, but then to invite God's Spirit into that. And to, say, and to remind myself, Spirit, I do not think that is your voice in me. I don't think your voice is saying, justify yourself. I think your voice says, trust me. Trust me. Depend on me. And so for me, it starts at the beginning of the day of surrendering my expectations, surrendering my ambitions, and just surrendering the day. And instead, instead just starting saying, Spirit, I'm yours. Like, your agenda today. This is... What, what is it that you have for me? And let me just paint two pictures of my days. One, when I think I'm not living in the Spirit. I'm living by human effort. And then one, when I'm living in the Spirit. So when I give in to those voices, so those voices that I wake up with most days, um, I live my day by human effort. And here's what my day looks like. First, uh, I walk through my day anxious. And sometimes I can literally, like my breathing is more shallow. Uh, I walk through my day more hurried. I, I just move from task to task trying to get things done. And I never pause just to step back and breathe and reflect for a moment. Uh, I move through my day having this very high need for my day to go a certain way. That there are, there are certain outcomes I predetermined for my day. And when I achieve those outcomes, I feel good about myself. And when I don't, I don't feel good about myself. And when it comes to engaging with people, what happens when I'm living that way is, is I either kind of view them as ministry projects <laughs> to, to fix and to, to help, or I view them as obstacles, as hindrances to me getting the things done that, that I think are, are somehow preventing me from achieving the outcomes that I want to achieve. But generally, I, when I live in my flesh, I live with this very heavy sense of responsibility and everything feels serious. And there's this subtle comparison thing going on where I'm trying to figure out how do I measure up to those around me. And at the end of one of those days, I might look back and say, technically, I, I checked off a lot of boxes today. Like I was productive in a certain way. But the truth is that day lacked any real spiritual power. Like any lasting spiritual fruit did not come of that day. I just, I just checked boxes really to ease my own issues, my own you know, needs. And on the other hand, when I'm able to start the day and offer to the Spirit and just live my day surrendered to the Spirit, um, here's what that day looks like for me. At first, I am much less anxious. In fact, I feel like I, I walk through the day with a lightheartedness and even a joy. And I think it's because I walk through the day realizing this isn't really about me. Like this day is not up to me to produce what needs to be produced. That's God's work. That's not my work. So I'm, I'm free to, to actually be kind of playful and lighthearted through the day. I live in grace. Um, that is maybe the biggest thing. I, I, I recognize I don't need to justify anything. I don't need to prove anything. I'm already justified. So I get to just live from that place of God's grace and favor on me. I move through the day in a much less hurried way. And, and the other main thing I would say is I'm just more present to the moments of my day. I'm present to the simple tasks before me rather than having these like ambitious and sort of, you know, driven goals. I'm able to just take the simple tasks before me and go through them with trust, with love, with faithfulness. And I'm present to the people around me. I, I, I actually enjoy the people around me rather than just seeing them as, as projects or obstacles. I enjoy them. I receive them as the wonderful gifts that they are to me. And the last thing I'd say is I'm open to the surprising on those days. Like, I'm more interruptible on those days because I'm realizing, hey, my agenda is, is not that important. It's the Spirit's agenda. And so, gosh, God, you might have 
an agenda that's different. And I want to be interruptible today. I want to be open, genuinely open to the surprising. And at the end of one of those days, when I look back at that day, um, I may not have checked off as many boxes as I had hoped to check off. Uh, I may have been less productive in a certain way. Uh, but that day had spiritual power and, and oftentimes real spiritual fruit. Like maybe there was a conversation that took place that I was available to that was that's going to be a lasting, meaningful conversation for me or for somebody else. Or maybe there was just a moment in my day where there was this deep connection with God that was surprising, that, was, that I needed, that I would not have been open to. So that's my own process. That's what it's looking like for me in this season of my life. And it's going to look different for each one of us. But I want to leave you with that invitation. Having begun with the Spirit, let's continue every day of our lives in the Spirit. One of the best ways we can resist the temptation to live our lives in our own strength, apart from the Holy Spirit's empowerment, is to devote ourselves to prayer. Prayer is this great reminder of who's Lord of our lives and who's not. And our going to God in prayer represents a spirit of dependency on Him. And as we move through our hours and our days, being continually mindful of that can really make all the difference in the world as we look to Him and not ourselves for everything we need. So let's do that now in prayer together. Lord, we thank that You and only You are God that you will take us along the paths into the places you wish us to go. We confess our desire to want to control all things and guarantee all outcomes and to take matters in our own hands, in our own strength and apart from you. But we acknowledge now we were not made to carry that burden. May we instead cling to you and remain in you because we know all the good we long for and all the fruit we hope to bear, if it's truly good and authentic, only comes from you. Father, whatever we are to become, we want to do it through the power of your Spirit. So may our dependence on you not only start with you, but stay with you, moment by moment, day by day. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall.
God, we need you, God. Draw us with your words, with your truth, with your presence toward you and your spirit and your son. Hold us fast, spirit. Keep the things of the world away from us as we turn to you and your truth again. We love you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we hope this morning has been encouraging to you, and we would encourage you now to consider some reflection questions that we'll provide on your screens. And let us leave you with this benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good word and deed. Amen. Amen.